Early attempts by 19th century physicists to understand atoms and molecules met with only limited success. By assuming that molecules behave like rebounding balls, physicists were able to predict and explain some macroscopic phenomena, such as the pressure exerted by a gas. However, this model did not account for the stability of molecules. That is, it could not explain the forces that held atoms together. It took a long time to realize, and an even longer time to accept, that the properties of atoms and molecules are not governed by the same physical laws as larger objects. The new era in physics started in 1900 with a young German physicist named Max Planck. While analyzing the data on radiation emitted by solids heated to various temperatures, Planck discovered that atoms and molecules emit energy only in certain discrete quantities or quanta. Physicists had always assumed that energy is continuous and that any amount of energy could be released in a radiation process. Planck's quantum theory turned physics upside down. Indeed, the flurry of research that ensued altered our concept of nature forever. To understand Planck's quantum theory, we must first know something about the nature of waves. A wave can be thought of as a vibrating disturbance by which energy is transmitted. The fundamental properties of a wave are illustrated by a water wave. The regular variation of peaks and troughs enable us to sense the propagation of waves. Waves are characterized by their length and height and by the number of waves that pass through a certain point in one second. Wavelength, which we use the symbol lambda for, is the distance between identical points on successive waves. The frequency, for which we use the variable nu, is the number of waves that pass through a particular point in one second, and amplitude is the vertical distance from the midline of a wave to a peak or a trough. Another important property of waves is their speed, which depends on the type of wave and the nature of the medium through which the wave is traveling, for example, whether it's air, water, or a vacuum. The speed, for which we use the symbol u, of a wave is the product of its wavelength and its frequency. That is speed, which again we use u is equal to wavelength lambda times frequency nu. It's important to note that frequency is measured in cycles per second or hertz. And so if we plug in numbers into this equation and we use meters for our wavelength and then we use cycles per second or reciprocal seconds for our frequency, we see that speed or u is equal to meters per second. Again, one reciprocal second is equal to a hertz. There are many kinds of waves, such as water waves, sound waves, and light waves. In 1873, James Clerk Maxwell proposed that visible light consists of electromagnetic waves. According to Maxwell's theory, an electromagnetic wave has an electric field component and a magnetic field component. These two components have the same wavelength and frequency and hence the same speed, but they travel in mutually perpendicular planes as shown in this picture right here. The significance of Maxwell's theory is that it provides a mathematical description of the general behavior of light. In particular, his model accurately describes how energy in the form of radiation can be propagated through space as vibrating electric and magnetic fields. Electromagnetic radiation is the emission and transmission of energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves travel at 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and that's rounded off, or 186,000 miles per second in a vacuum. This speed differs from one medium to another, but not enough to distort our calculations significantly. By convention, we use the symbol C for the speed of electromagnetic waves or as it is more commonly called, the speed of light. The wavelength of electromagnetic waves is usually given in nanometers. Let's try an example problem. The wavelength of the green light from a traffic signal is centered at 522 nanometers. What is the frequency of this radiation? Well, to solve this problem, we can use the formula that the speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency. We know our wavelength is 522 nanometers, but we also know that one nanometer is equal to one times 10 to the minus nine meters. And so we could rewrite this wavelength in meters as being 522 times 10 to the minus nine meters. Now we're looking for the frequency or nu, and so we can rearrange the equation to be 
nu is equal to C over lambda. And what is our C? Well, it's green light, it's electromagnetic radiation, and we know that it travels at a speed of 3.00 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Now we can just plug in some numbers. We have our speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by our wavelength in meters, 522 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. We see that the units of meters cancel out, and we're left with reciprocal seconds, or hertz. And so our frequency is going to be equal to 5.75 times 10 to the power of 14 reciprocal seconds, or you could call that hertz as well. This figure shows various types of electromagnetic radiation, which differ from one another in wavelength and frequency. The long radio waves are emitted by large antennas, such as those by broadcasting station. The shorter visible light waves are produced by the motion of electrons within atoms and molecules. The shortest waves, which also have the highest frequency, are associated with gamma rays, which result from changes within the nucleus of an atom. As we will see later on, the higher the frequency, the more energetic the radiation. Thus, ultraviolet radiation, x-rays, and gamma rays are high-energy radiation. Something else you might notice about the electromagnetic spectrum is that the region of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is visible to the human eye, is actually a very narrow range. It goes from about 400 nanometers to around 700 nanometers. If we take our equation c is equal to lambda times nu, or the speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency, remember that all of these different types of electromagnetic radiation all have the same speed. And so if we were to solve this equation for lambda, let's say, for wavelength, you can see that wavelength is equal to c over nu. What does that tell us? That tells us that wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency, meaning the longer wavelength the shorter the frequency. And the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. When solids are heated, they emit electromagnetic radiation over a wide range of wavelengths. The dull red glow of an electric heater and the bright white light of a tungsten light bulb are examples of radiation from heated solids. Measurements taken in the latter part of the 19th century show that the amount of radiant energy emitted by an object at a certain temperature depends on its wavelength. Attempts to account for this dependence in terms of established wave theory and thermodynamic laws were only partially successful. One theory explained short wavelength dependence but failed to account for longer wavelengths. Another theory accounted for the longer wavelengths but failed for short wavelengths. It seemed that something fundamental was missing from the classical laws of physics. Max Planck solved the problem with an assumption that departed drastically from accepted concepts. Classical physics assumed that atoms and molecules could emit or absorb any arbitrary amount of radiant energy. Planck said that atoms and molecules could emit or absorb energy only in discrete quantities, like small packages or bundles. Planck gave the name quantum to the smallest quantity of energy that can be emitted or absorbed in the form of electromagnetic radiation. The energy, or E, of a single quantum is given by this formula shown right here. E is equal to H times nu, where H is called Planck's constant and nu is the frequency of radiation. The value of Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Since we know that speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency, and we can solve for frequency being equal to speed of light over wavelength, now we can rewrite this equation right here to say that energy is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light over wavelength. And now you can see that the energy of light is inversely proportional to wavelength. According to quantum theory, energy is always admitted in integral multiples of h times nu. For example, h nu, 2 times h nu, 3 times h nu, etc. But never, for example, 1.67 times h nu or 4.98 times h nu. At the time Planck presented his theory, he could not explain why energies should be fixed or quantized in this manner. Starting with the hypothesis, however, he had no trouble correlating the experimental data for the emission by solids over the entire range of wavelengths. They all supported quantum theory.
The idea that energy should be quantized or bundled may seem strange, but the concept of quantization has many analogies. For example, an electric charge is also quantized. There can be only whole number multiples of E, the charge of an electron. Matter itself is quantized for the numbers of electrons, protons, or neutrons in the number of atoms in a sample of matter. They also have to be integers. Our money system is based on a quantum of a value called a penny. Even processes in living systems involve quantized phenomena. The eggs laid by hens, for example, are quantized. A pregnant cat, for example, gives birth to an integral number of kittens, not to one half or three quarters of a kitten. And so the energy emitted by those solids when they were heated, that's called black body radiation. The energy emitted can only have certain values. It can only have the values, you know, right at these different stairs here. In fact, um, it can't be anywhere in between. Okay, so you see where these arrows are like this? It cannot be in between these areas here. It has to be at one of these particular energy levels. That, that is the quantization of energy. That is, again, that the energy has to have specific values.